Um, well, firstly, thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, gosh, it, it's, it's quite hard for me because um, as you hear my story, it's actually really recent. This didn't happen to me years and years ago. It's a real, real honor um, because according to doctors, various experts, well, pretty much every expert in both South America, US and UK, and medical reports, um, I shouldn't be here at all today. Um, I thank my lucky stars to be alive, to have my mind, my speech and my mobility, which I think we all take for granted, because I was told that if I did survive, then I wouldn't have any of that. My outcome was die or the slim chance of survival, I'd be severely brain damaged. Um, my mum was devastated, as you can imagine. I'm sure there's a lot of parents in the room and, and fathers. Um, she thought she was going to lose her daughter or she'd be caring for her daughter for the rest of her life, pushing her around in a wheelchair and changing her nappies. Um, the reason why I'm here is because if what happened to me can help save just one life, then everything I went through was absolutely worth it. And I think you'll agree after hearing it, it wasn't very nice. Um, I'll start at the beginning because uh, it's an interesting beginning. I cycled from, wait for it, London, England. That's London, England, miles and miles and miles away to Rio, Brazil, which is miles and miles away. <laughs> That's 3,000 miles in five weeks. Don't do it. <laughs> it was for charity, but still don't do it. Um, so my plan was, it was amazing. My plan was to cycle there in five weeks, 3,000 miles, raise money for charity, raise awareness, and arrive in the Olympics. And as you can see, I'm a TV host, TV broadcaster, so I would be hosting on the Olympic Games. And I was doing all the amazing interviews for all the gold medalists. It was fantastic. Perfect story. Now, before I got on my bicycle to take the slightly insane challenge, of course, I went to two different doctors, asked about safety, inoculations, um, because I was cycling to very remote parts of Brazil. I had every jab under the sun, yellow fever, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, rabies, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine it cost me 500 US dollars. Um, I also took advice about Zika, which at the time was something that was in the news every day. Two independent professionals told me that I didn't need to take any anti-malarials at all. They checked my route and said I was going to a low-risk zone, so I'd be absolutely fine. Great. You trust them? Far away. You never think about malaria again, right? So I was ready to go, route planned, every precaution taken. I went bore you with the cycle, but I did it. <laughs> I made it. That was absolutely fine. I completed the challenge. I actually got stronger as the day went on. Um, and I arrived at the planned date in Rio, which was the 4th of August last year, 2016. And the finish was the top of the Christ Redeemer, which was amazing. So I managed to cycle to the very top. But I actually felt really weird. I got to the top and I felt very strange. I'm quite a hyperactive person, so normally I'm like jumping about like crazy, and I wasn't. I had a little sense of joy or enjoyment, and I just felt really weird, to be honest. And I had a stomach ache. But I thought, well, I've cycled all that way, so maybe that's why. Um, I carried on doing what I had to do. Typical me, I did press at the Olympic Park. Um, but by the time I got to the opening ceremony at the Olympic Games, I was in excruciating pain. I had the worst diarrhea, and I started to be sick. Um, so bad that, sorry, this is a little bit graphic. Um, blood was actually coming out of both my mouth and my bottom. And I ended up lying on the stone floor of the Olympic Stadium toilets while the ceremony was going on. But I was thinking, like, no, I can't be unwell. I'm working. It's a dream to be part of the games. Like, Ugh, I can't possibly be unwell. This is the worst timing ever. Um, I ended up at the doctors. Uh, they put me on two drips and told me I was severely dehydrated. And I was like, OK, great. I'm dehydrated. Of course, I've cycled all that way. Um, just put, me, put the drips in me and let me go type thing. Um, and they did. And then they told me to go. And I left the hospital. And four hours later, I was lying on the floor, bleeding everywhere and screaming, and I could hardly move. I went back to the hospital using Google Translate, because bearing in mind, I don't speak Portuguese. They don't speak English, um, to try and explain what was going on through te real tears. Um, I even took photos of, to show what was coming out of me to try and really show them that something was wrong. Um, little did I know that Google Translate would become mine and my mum's best friend. Uh, I was immediately admitted to hospital then and had needles stuck in everywhere. Um, I lied there for three days, um, not in conditions that we're used to. I was lying there in my own excrement, blood and vomit, not knowing what was going on. I was on my own. 
incredibly scared, but at the same time, <laughs> very much what I do, convincing myself that I'm fine. <laughs> um, and I'd wake up better, miraculously, the next morning. I was even texting my agent, saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I can carry on with the job. Just tell them I'll be there tomorrow. Please tell them I'm fine, you know, don't give it to somebody else. Um, on the third day, my health insurance were called. My mum was informed. My friends were told, the British consulate, I'm British, you might have noticed from my accent, got involved. <laughs> um, my kidneys had failed, my colon and pancreas had stopped working, and I was actually told by a doctor that I was dying. I um, don't know if any of you have experienced that, you can imagine what it's like. Um, I was transferred to another hospital, a bigger one with an intensive care. After a day of persuading my health insurance to take the case, because they didn't immediately, and I couldn't be admitted until they took it. They finally moved me, and it was in this, like, 1970s ambulance style. Can you picture it? And all I could think about was lying on this stretcher in, in tremendous pain, was the doors of the ambulance kind of flinging me out, and I was going to fly out of the back and end up on the pavement in some, like, weird comedy sketch. It was, like, all that could go through my head, because there's a lot of potholes in Rio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I made it, and after hours in A&E screaming to everyone, no Portuguese, English, I was taken to intensive care, I was put on oxygen and a dialysis machine. I really couldn't believe what was happening, and it suddenly hit me then, like I'm joking now, but it hit me then that it was serious. And it must have been because my mum was already on a plane flying over, and trust me, this is not something my mum would do lightly. By the time my mum arrived, I was throwing up constantly, lying in blood and diarrhea and could hardly breathe. And she walked into the door of the intensive care, and I play this in my head quite a lot. And I just desperately wanted to reassure her. I didn't want to hurt her. I didn't want her to see me like that. And she had tears in her eyes and started to cry. At that time, my lungs were collapsing. And I just said, I'm so sorry, Mum. I'm so sorry. And she said, this is one way to get me to Brazil. <laughs> I want to paint a picture of what my mum was like. <laughs> And she walked out of the, fr the room, and I just felt really incredibly heartbroken. Like, how could I do this to my mum, to my family, to my friends? What's going to happen? Am I going to die? I felt so scared, alone. I was in hospital in Brazil. I couldn't speak the language. And at this point, nobody knew what was wrong with me. The doctor went to speak to my mum, and she'd only been there an hour off the plane from England. And he said, in these exact words, in broken English, Joy, that's my mum's name, I fear for your daughter's life. I need you to sign this form. Her organs are failing. Her body is dying. We need to put her in a coma and intubate her. Otherwise, she'll die in the next 24 hours. My mum signed it and made the choice not to tell me what was going to happen. And I was deteriorating fast then. My brother had flown over by this time and my agent. I was put in a coma and on a life support machine. That was day four. Now... I, I debated whether to put this in, but I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because it, it was a big part of what happened to me. I woke up during the operation where they put the breathing machine in your lungs. Um, in Brazil, they paralyze you. I don't know whether it's common practice everywhere. I'm apparently told it's not in the US and the UK. Um, but the sedation was minimal due to the, how critically ill I was. Um, and I was choking, and I could feel them kind of like pulling at my hair. And I couldn't move or open my eyes or speak because obviously I was paralyzed. And I knew that I was in hospital, so I was aware. And I soon figured out that they didn't know I could hear or feel. So I was extremely distressed. And at that point, they feared not only for my life, as I mentioned at the top of my speech, but that I would be brain damaged. So they put brain nodes on my head, and that's where, what I could feel of them pulling my hair. Um, my mum sat by my side, and every day that I was in the coma, wrote me letters. I'd like to read you, if it's okay, an extract of the first letter, just to show what malaria really can do to not just the victim, but the family. Um, when she arrived, she was greeted to give some context to my friend, by my friend Annie, who would also come over. Um, and this is the picture that she was looking at in real life when she was writing this letter. Um, I hope this works. The one, this one here. Dear Charlotte, that's what my mum calls me, everybody else calls me Charlie. <laughs> I, I just needed to show you what you look like from our eyes. When you're better, it is your time. No need to prove to yourself anymore. We all love you so much. Very shocking when I arrived at the hospital. Annie looked like a zombie from The Walking Dead. 
She was fantastic as the insurance messed up my accommodation. It was too far away. The doctor said this place is far too dangerous. You need to go be near the hospital. So I stayed at your Airbnb. Annie gave me wine and cake with this shocked look in her eyes. I had a laugh with her. Not sleep, just wine induced. Picture of you in my head. Please, you have nothing to prove. I think it was. Please be with me. I prayed and cried, Mum. So, shall I take this off the screen or shall I leave it on? It's up to everybody. Okay. I don't want it to disturb people. Um, I'm not sure what everyone's perception of a coma is, but maybe this will change. And you can see how still I look from the outside. Um, and I was hooked up to every machine and I couldn't move, I couldn't speak, I couldn't see. But I could hear everything. <laughs> And I knew when my mum was talking, my brother was talking, my friend was talking, my agent. And I could hear them saying that I was getting worse. And they still didn't know what it was at this stage. Uh, the doctors told my family that I couldn't hear and that my reactions, because I had these reactions where I'd flicker my eyes or I'd like move my arms or hit, hit the bed, were just the nervous system. They were not. They were me trying to communicate in that. And I was in so much pain. I concentrated so hard, as I was just telling you about my hands, that I figured that if I put every thin, every bit of energy and every spirit I had into my hands that I could move them, I focused so hard, I actually started to bang on the bed when my mum was in the room, and she realised I was still there and I was fighting. To me, I had to show her that I wouldn't leave and I would never give up. So I was trying desperately to communicate her, with her. The doctors restrained me. <laughs> as you can see in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> they thought differently. They didn't believe that I was still there. I got worse each day of the coma. And by day 10, I had to be aggressively resuscitated. But they said the chances of me surviving that night were slim. My friends and my family were told to prepare themselves. The doctors still didn't know what was wrong. I've been hospitalized for 10 days now. And they took every test under the sun, yellow fever, Zika, Rocky Mountain fever. There's a huge crazy list that I've read that is of everything you can possibly imagine and you can't pronounce, apart from one disease. The oldest disease in the world, one of the most deadliest diseases, the one that right now kills a child every two minutes, the one that has already killed half of mankind, and the one that very nearly killed me. You know what it is, malaria. Dr. Cecilia, on a last-minute whim, decided to send my bloods to San Francisco and test for malaria as a complete last resort. Thank God she did. By this point, it had completely taken over my body. I had no red blood cells. I was on permanent blood transfusions. I had complete organ failure. And to the people on the outside, the only thing that was keeping me alive was that goddamn machine. But from the inside... So was I. My mind, my soul, and my spirit. I knew I was dying. I knew, but I was absolutely fighting. I was fighting so goddamn hard to stay alive. I desperately wanted to live. And for one sh short second, I did accept my fate. And I thought, well, maybe this was it. But I knew that it wasn't. And there was no way that I was going to give in. I had this conversation. To me, I felt like it was a conversation with death. And death told me to go with it. And I spoke to it, and, and its energy like ushered me away from me. Uh, and it got more forceful, telling me that I had to go. And I pictured my funeral. I saw my mum and my brothers dev devastated. And I want to show you a bit about human spirit, because I fought so hard. And I said, like, no, I can't leave. I can't leave my mum. I can't do that to her. She doesn't deserve it. This can't be it. I have so much life to give, too much to do in my life. I can't go. You can't take me. No, I will not go. <laughs> you will not win. I will fight. My friends call me stubborn. I don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> I fought and I fought and I was incredible. I was in incredible pain. I'm, I'm sure you can p feel. But I couldn't leave and I would fight through the pain and stay. I realized how much I desperately wanted to live. And it's not until you have to fight for your life that you realize just how precious it really is. The malaria results came back. Guess what? They were positive. <laughs> I had malaria. It was the strangest double-edged sword. As a last gasp chance to save me, the doctor started treating me for it. And I actually began to improve. Despite every odd that was against me, I survived. And I'm stood in front of you today, talking. 
both doctors in Brazil and UK said that it was a miracle, not only that I survived, but I survived with the recovery I have made. I was lying in bed, thinking I would never be able to feel the sun on my face, see my mum smile, smell flowers, run. I love to run. Use my legs, speak. I like to speak too. <laughs> I was so incredibly unlucky to have what happened to me. But I was so incredibly lucky to have survived. Despite the fact that I wasn't diagnosed immediately, there was a few problems there. I was diagnosed eventually, and I was given malaria treatment. The treatment saved my life, and I was one of the complete lucky ones. And that picture... <laughs> And that was the first time that I walked again, because I couldn't walk for a long time. Uh, it was only eight months ago. Um, yeah, the walking picture was probably seven months ago, and the coma was eight months ago. Um, I was in hospital for two months, but I was flown back uh, to England for a month of that. Um, I, I suppose what I want to say is that this doesn't just happen to people at the other side of the globe, and I think we can... All of us are quite guilty sometimes of disassociating ourselves from what happens <laughs> uh, with little conscience. Um, I caught malaria in the Americas, it, and in 2015, malaria cases in the Americas increased by 16% in comparison to cases reported in 2015. This corresponds with a de decrease directly in overall funding for malaria in this area. So we must continue to push forward not just in Africa, but in that region too, because this is on your doorstep. And this happened to me, and I don't want to be shock, it, shock value, but it absolutely could happen to you. I'm, no, I'm not special. <laughs> the mosquito didn't just pick me, just because it liked me. Um, it's happening to people right now all over the world, though, and that's our world. It's not some world over there. It's our world. Nearly half of the world's population is at risk of malaria. And we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and you know that because that's why you're in this room. And we can be so proud in our generation to actually end this, and it's something we can absolutely do. There's so much horrible things in the world right now, but this is something we can actually do, and we can actually save lives, which is incredible. But if human life isn't enough of a motivation, and it pains me to say it, but sometimes it's not in politics and in, in this world, so by investing in ending malaria, and I think you'll find this quite interesting in case you don't already know, if you invest in malaria in the U.S., you'll be, sorry, in malaria, you'll also be investing in the U.S. economy and the global economy, contributing directly to growth and stability, given that half of the U.S. exports, that's billions of dollars worth, go to developing malaria-ridden countries. It kind of makes sense to me, right? The developed world relies on the developing world as much as the developing relies on the developed. I think that's really important for us to remember. It's important that we understand it's a two-way relationship. We heavily rely on the developing world. Who do you think we trade with? Are there people in the room that think of numbers? Oh, I hope there's not too many. <laughs> I'm actually really bad at numbers. But over the last 15 years, $672 billion... I'll say that again. 15 years, $672 billion was lost from the global gross domestic product as a direct result of malaria. As we've heard today, and I'm sure you heard yesterday too, refugees, pregnant women and children are the most vulnerable to malaria. And without inclusion, growth globally is unsustainable. We have the current level of malaria investment, say 6.8 million lives, including myself, since 2010, and imagine if we hadn't, that'd be 6.8 million unnecessary deaths we could have prevented. We. Now, it's maybe a little bit controversial, but it puts things into perspective when one third of the money spent on one US Trident warfare submarine could eliminate malaria in the world for good. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. <laughs> it makes me think of that quote by a politician and a rater, I don't know if you've heard, Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And like with so many things, the question isn't whether we can. We know we can. It's preventable. It's treatable. We can end malaria in our lifetime once and for all. The real question I'd like to ask you all, and tomorrow, is do we actually have the courage to? Edmund Burke again said, nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. 
I'm stood up here only speaking, trying to use what happened to me last summer to try and prevent others dying. This is only a little, but if we all did our little instead of our nothing, our little collectively added together is enormous. It's life-changing, world-changing, life-saving. And just imagine what we could all do. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I hope it wasn't too much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you take Ah. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. Thank you.